Well, for those of you that don't know Drew Miles, you just got a chance to meet him briefly on the screen. And Drew should be here. Where are you, Drew? We'd love to come up. We've got a gift for you. <clears throat> and he's... You met his wife, Lauren, on the screen, but he's coming up all by it's himself. Right. You look like a ba lonely bachelor. We are so appreciative of everything that you've done here. I've had just the greatest opportunity to work with you on so many different projects. And uh, you're just a shining example of what a Christian is, and we value so much all your labor to us. So we want to treat you. So take your wife out and have a good time. Appreciate all right. it. Okay. Lauren, I know you didn't want to be introduced, but I want you to stand up. Stand up, Lauren. Lauren. Stand up. Just hold it. Just wait. Stand there. Look, Mark and I know... Uh, you have to stand? You have to stand. There you go. Thank you. Um, Drew couldn't do what he did here and, and, and volunteer as much. It's, he didn't have an understanding wife that understood she was part of what he's, he's doing here. So we should give her a hand. Right. <clears throat> oh, goodness. Is there something we can... I, I should have, uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, this is over here. Okay, just a minute, guys. Uh, talk to your neighbor. <laughs> if there's someone you don't know, say hi to them. That's seven, we're seven, six, five, four. Ah. Why do I bother with my notes? I'm not going to use them. Well... It gives me comfort to have them here, all right? And I apologize for this. Okay. <sighs> First question. Mark and I are continuing a series we started last week called uh, God Questions. And if you're visiting here, we got these questions uh, off the internet, P people uh, gave us, uh, submitted questions, and people dropped questions in on Sunday morning. And one of the questions that we hear repeatedly over and over again is this one. Why would a loving God send people to hell? You're not a Christian very long before someone's going to ask you that question. They say, your Bible says, you say that God is a God of love. Why would he send people to hell? Well, first, we have to remember that God's word specifically tells us that God doesn't wish anyone to go there, doesn't wish anybody to suffer the consequences of hell. And you can read about that in Matthew 18, verse 14, and we're going to read that passage in just a few minutes. Now, Jesus and other biblical writers give us a picture of hell that is sobering to anyone. Jesus tells us it's a place of eternal torment. Jesus mentioned hell, talked about hell 11 times. And last Sunday, we celebrated the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Not a myth, a legend, a hope of ours, but a fact of history that on the third day after Jesus was, resur uh, after he was crucified, he rose from the dead. And Jesus said, if I raise from the dead, it'll prove that what I said was true. And Jesus talked about hell 11 times. The consequences of hell is so disturbing <clears throat> that God sent his son to die for you and I so we could escape it. Now, I know that a lot of intelligent people don't believe that there is a hell. Believe that religion, is, it's a theology of religion to help manipulate people. Scare people into uh, adhering to a certain set of beliefs. But hell is a very real place. Just deciding that it doesn't exist doesn't make it go away. <clears throat> Muammar Gaddafi the former dictator of Libya, over a decade ago, England pulled their embassy out of Libya. And he was so ticked off, he was so angry about it, he made a decree that England was going to be wiped off from all the maps in Libya. The globes, everything. So for many, many years, if you were living in Libya and you tried to find England, it wasn't there. Where it should be, there was just water. Okay? 
Simply removing England from all maps didn't mean that England didn't exist. You get the point. Hell exists, and the Bible is very clear on this point. But the question we want to answer is, why would a loving God send people to hell? One reason why people go to hell, and before I even <clears throat> go any further, God doesn't send anybody to hell. People make a choice to go there. But one reason why people end up in hell is because of God's holiness. God is a holy God, and he can't be contaminated by sin. Sin cannot enter heaven. And both Mark and I could talk a lot about, spend a whole sermon talking about God's holiness and, and the reason why Jesus had to come to take our punishment upon himself for sin. Without Jesus Christ <clears throat> and, ex and accessing that gift of forgiveness, your sin remains. And God cannot bring sin into heaven with him. God is also a just God. God punishes sin. Saddam Hussein is going to be punished. Adolf Hitler is going to be, going to be punished. That, that child sex molester is going to be punished. God is a just God. Now, God has ultimately given you and I, men and women all over the world, a free choice, freedom to make choices. And frankly, in the end, God gives people what they want. What I'm saying is, again, hell is a choice. Now, God ultimately doesn't want anybody to go there, Matthew 18. Jesus decides, and I mean, Jesus desires and God desires that none shall perish. Matthew 18, 14 says, I wish that no one would go. Is the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish? Ezekiel 33, 11. <clears throat> As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I desire that the wicked turn from their evil ways and live. Men and women make a choice to go to hell. All through their lives, they tell God, I don't want you. Get out of my life. Go away. I don't believe you exist. Go away. Don't tell me about God. He doesn't exist. Go away. I don't, not want, I don't want anything to do with you. Leave me alone. Hell is God finally saying, you can have your wish. You can't blame God for anyone going to hell. They made a choice to go there. They, have made, they may have made that choice that there is no God based on very logical arguments or thoughts or whatever. But the Bible says, Romans 1, that everyone knows there's a God. Everyone is born with the knowledge of God. If you just look at creation, you should be able to figure out that there is a God. Romans 1. We will choose by our choices where we will spend eternity, each and every one of us. Now here's another thought, and that is, we're all sinners, and we all deserve to go to hell because God is holy, and he can't be around sin. And so we're all sinners, and we all deserve to spend eternity apart from God. But John 3, 16, this is the most concise verse I can think of, and we all know it. But God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We have to remember that hell, Gehenna, was originally created for Lucifer, the devil, and his demons, the angels that rebelled in heaven. It was never made for, for men and women, ever. So it comes down to choices. God doesn't force heaven on us. It's a choice we make. He pleads with us to be reconciled to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of us who do, and I hope everyone in here has, you access the freedom. This doesn't mean that we're better than anyone else, does it? We're all, this is a, the, the point I tried to make very quickly earlier, is none of us is better than anybody else. We're all sinners. We all need a Savior. So ultimately, because we all need a Savior, ultimately, the choice, you determine, the choice you make determines your eternity. Eternity with him or eternity without him. Amen. That's it. First question done. Oh, I don't like talking about hell. Just, just so you know. All right. <clears throat>
One question that gets Wait, wait, wait. What did you just do? They're all laughing. They're all laughing. I know it's at my expense. I think expense. they're laughing what, what at is you. It? Huh? I didn't do anything. I think they're laughing at you. Okay. That's okay, as long as you didn't do something. Okay. Another one a lot of people ask, and that is, how do we know the Bible is true? In other words, why should we accept the Bible as God's word? Has it been changed over the years? Have, uh, have men changed it throughout the years? And what about other holy books? Why consider the Bible God's word rather than those books? Well, let's start there. Let's compare the Bible to some of the other religious uh, books of the world. First of all, let me say that the Bible is absolutely unique in that it's the most universal. The Bible was the first book ever translated. It was translated in 250 B.C. into Greek from the Hebrew. It's the most universal. Do you know that the Bible has already been translated into an amazing 2,426 languages? Now compare that to the Quran, which has been uh, translated into 47, and the Book of Mormon, which has been translated into 87. And then let's think about its circulation around the world. Do you know that every year, over 100 million Bibles are sold uh, in the world? But even more staggering than that is the fact that there are 900 million uh, either Bibles or New Testaments that are distributed for free. That means that every year there are a billion Bibles either sold or distributed for free on this planet. You know, there's 7 billion people, so that would mean that every seven years there's been enough Bibles printed or distributed for each person. Um, <clears throat> let's look for a minute at the composition and compare these. How were these books composed? Well, first of all, we'll start with the Quran. Uh, here's my copy. It's about two-thirds the size of the New Testament. I've read the Quran from cover to cover twice. And uh, it came about because Muhammad claimed that the angel Gabriel appeared to him in a, uh, a cave a number of times over uh, a number of years, and that he recited to him the Quran. Now, Muhammad could neither read nor write, so he would commit that to memory, he would uh, recite it to his followers, and they would write it down. So the Quran was produced by one man over a span of, you know, a lifetime of one, of one year, and uh, it, came his, it came with no miracles. There were no miracles to attest that that was a prophecy from God. That was a problem for Muhammad because... Uh, most of the people in the land at that time, or many of them were either Christians or Jews. He was hoping they would convert. But their argument was, you said you're the greatest prophet, and yet all the prophets of the Old Testament, and all the apostles of the New Testament, Jesus, they did great miracles. And his answer is in the Quran. This is the answer that the angel Gabriel gave him. They say, why have not signs, that is miracles, been sent down to him from his Lord? That's what the Jews and the Christians would say. And here's the answer he's to give. Say... Such signs are with Allah alone, and I am only a plain warner. Is it not sufficient for them that we have sent down the book, that is the Quran, uh, upon thee to be recited to them? In other words, the only sign or miracle they're going to get is this book. Let's look at the Book of Mormon for a, mi a minute. The Book of Mormon, of course, came from Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith claimed that the angel Moroni appeared to him and uh, gave him some golden tablets, and he was given the ability to translate these tablets, and then he gave these golden tablets back to the angel, and so they're not around for anyone else to check out. And so again with him, we have the composition of the Book of Mormon, one man over a space of a few years with no miracles given to attest that he is a prophet. Now let's compare that for a minute with the Bible. The Bible is not a single book written by a single man. The Bible is, of course, 66 books written by 44 different authors over a span of 1,600 years. So m people of many different generations living in many different, uh, a number of different countries, and uh, they were everything from kings to fishermen to prisoners to shepherds to court officials and yet the Bible speaks amazingly with one voice. Now let's compare these uh, books also with the element of prophecy. Let's look at that. Now none of the other books, neither the Quran nor the Vedas, which is the Hebrew scripture, excuse me, the, uh, 
not Hebrews, uh, the Hindu scriptures, uh, the Book of Mor uh, Mormon, the uh, Bhagavad Gita, or any of these other books, none of these have predictive prophecies in them. There were no prophecies that you can now look back and check out and see if they happened. But the Bible, of course, is filled with hundreds of prophecies. The most interesting of these are the ones that relate to Jesus Christ. And so we have in the Old Testament prophecies about where he would be born, the nature of his birth, that it would be virgin, where he would grow up, the nature of his life, many details, many details about his death, how he would die, the circumstances surrounding it, about his resurrection. In fact, so precise are all these prophecies about Jesus, the skeptics for hundreds of years charged that what had happened was that the Christians must have gone back and inserted those predictive prophecies about Jesus into the Old Testament writings. Well, what happened, as many of you know, that uh, squashed that, was in 1947, there was a discovery in a cave in um, Israel called of the Dead Sea Scrolls. These were copies of the Old Testament that this, the Qumran community had preserved and hidden in caves uh, during a time when they were being attacked. All of, there were 38 of the 39 books were found in these caves, and all of them were written before the birth of Christ, and guess what? They're just like what you hold in your hand. Every prophecy was in there. So uh, that proves that those, uh, you know, just one more proof of the predictive element in Scripture. Now, the most important reason to accept the Old Testament as God's Word is that Jesus accepted it as God's Word. He quoted from it often. He cited it as God's Word, and he, of course, is the creator of all things. He came from heaven. He certainly knows what God's Word is. Now, how about the question, is the New Testament reliable? Has it been changed over time, as sometimes you hear people claim? Well, there's no reason to doubt the reliability of the Old Testament or the New Testament. In other words, that the book that you, ha that you hold in your hand is just as it was originally written by the apostles. We have over 5,000 ancient manuscripts. That means copies of the Bible or portions of the Bible from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. Our earliest copy of a portion of the Bible is a fragment of the Gospel of John. In other words, m most of that scroll had been destroyed, but a fragment uh, was preserved. And it dates to within an amazing 25 years of the time that the Gospel of John was written. We have an entire copy of the Bible, all the different books of the New Testament, excuse me, put together in the Chester B.D. Papyri, and that dates to within 100 years of when it was written. And when we look at these ancient um, documents, they're just as what you have in uh, your hand today. And by the fact that we have so many different ones, we're able to compare them, and we're able to find out any place that perhaps a copyist error came in. We can weed those out by comparing the different ones and seeing where the error is. Now, 100 years may seem remarkable, or excuse me, 100 years may seem like a long time. You're thinking, wow, 100 years between the time it was written before we have a copy of the whole New Testament. But I want to, I want to uh, just compare that to other ancient documents. Let's look at the writings of Aristotle. The earliest document we have, or copy of Aristotle, is 1,400 years after he wrote and we only have five ancient copies. Tacitus, the Roman historian, the earliest copy is 1,000 years after he wrote. We have 20 copies total. And uh, Herodotus, the great Greek historian, we have uh, 1,300 years between the time he wrote that and the first copy that we have. We have a total of eight copies. But with the New Testament, we have the whole thing within 100, the Gospel of John within 25, and we have 5,000 copies. So let's finish. I got one more question I want to answer, and that is something that you hear about all the time on the History Channel and stuff. What about the so-called lost books of the Bible or the lost Gospels? Why do we have the 27 books in the New Testament that we have? Why not some of these other ones? Was it just politics that got it in, as, as some would have you believe? Let me just tell you, there's an awful lot of bad, I wouldn't even call it scholarship, trash out there. <laughs> that you'll see on the TV. There are three basic reasons, three basic tests 
for a book to be considered to be in the New Testament canon. The first one, it had to have apostolic authorship. The book had to be written by an apostle or under an apostle's supervision. This is because the apostles were the chosen representatives by Jesus Christ to bring forth his teaching. And so in the New Testament, it's written by the apostle Paul, the apostle John, the apostle James, the apostle Peter, the apostle Matthew. And then there's the gospel of Mark. Mark was an associate. He was under the um, uh, supervision of Peter. He wrote Peter's gospel. And then there was Luke, who, of course, was uh, part of Paul's apostolic team and wrote under his. The second test to be considered to be a New Testament is that the book and the teaching had to agree with the apostolic doctrine. Now, going back to Jesus and through the 12 chosen apostles, there had been clear doctrine set forth in the church. And so the church measured these books by were they faithful to the apostolic doctrine. And the third thing was that to be considered to be in the New Testament, the book had to be accepted as the word of God by all the churches. In other words, uh, the church in Syria, the church in Greek, the church in North Africa, in Egypt, all of them had to recognize that as the word of God. What about these so-called lost or forgotten Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Peter or even the Gospel of Mary? Well, they failed on all three of these accounts. First of all, they were spurious. That is, they were forgeries. They were actually written long after the death of the person whose name they carried. So they were written perhaps 100 years after the death of Peter. The second thing is, that they did not agree with the apostolic doctrine which was held by all the churches. Rather, they reflected Gnostic thought. I know a lot of you perhaps are not familiar with that, but Gnosticism was a perversion of Christianity. It came from the blending of Christianity with Eastern thought. So think sort of a New Age version of Christianity. And so it was rejected on that grounds. Finally, it was never accepted by the churches. It was only accepted by certain Gnostic um, schismatic groups. If you read it, it doesn't read like historical narrative at all. It reads like just sayings of Jesus. So perhaps they were even, uh, quote, channeled uh, through various Gnostic prophets. So those lost, so-called lost gospels were rejected by the early church from being scripture for the same reason that all reliable, you know, fair-minded scholars reject them now. They fail the three basic tests. So I want to just say to you that you can have confidence that this book you hold in your hand is God's Word. God did communicate to humankind. This book is absolutely unique, and He will speak to you as you read it today. Thank you. All right, the next question, uh, Mark and I really, we, we went back and forth whether we were going to do it or not. It's about marijuana. <laughs> I mean, people are asking about it, and uh, what's wrong with smoking marijuana? You would be surprised how many people ask this question. They relate it to having one glass of wine or something like that. And, and I even talked to a doctor. When you smoke marijuana, it goes you know, because your smoke, it gets into your lungs, it gets into your bloodstream, and, it, and affects you almost instantly. It isn't like alcohol. But anyway, um, <clears throat> marijuana um, change how, changes how the brain works. It's a psychoactive, mind-altering drug. It's associated with addiction. And I'm going to say that again, addiction, you'll see in a minute. People say, you know, you don't get addicted. Respiratory illness, mental illness, poor motor performance, and cognitive impairment. Now, all this is troubling um, since research now seems to suggest that people who use marijuana on a regular basis, um, 1 in 11 seem to grow dependent upon it. It's very hard for them to stop. And what's really scary for me is this risk rises to 1 in 6 in teenagers. If a teenager uses it on a regular basis, they become dependent on it. 
dependent, addicted, I don't know what the difference is. In 2009, marijuana was involved in 376,000 emergency department visits. It is the most common illegal drug found in drivers who die in car accidents. Among youth who receive substance abuse treatment, and please listen to this, marijuana accounts for 61% of those under 15 and 56% of those 15 and 19. Now, I got all these facts and a lot others off the National Institute of Drug Abuse straight off, straight off of the White House website. You can go. I mean, this is the official, official, official uh, stats of the United States Department of Drug Abuse. Now, another thing, as of right now, marijuana has not been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. We can praise God for that. <laughs> as I was studying this, there are some who think that uh, marijuana in pill form, some, some uh, in, in ingredients in marijuana, could be very useful uh, for, for people who've had chemotherapy as far as helping them to regain appetite and uh, um, help with n nauseousness. But this whole <clears throat> medical marijuana to me is the biggest joke to come around in a long time. It's just so people can smoke it. Oh, I've got a headache. And then, you know, they get it. Whatever. <laughs> um, I could tell you some stories about that. I can tell you that it's not hard to get. No major medical association has come out in favor of smoking marijuana. None, zip, zero, nod, nada. Now, several states we know have passed same-sex laws, right? You can get married. If two men want to get married in, 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 in some states, they've made it legal. But that doesn't make it right. Some states have, you know, they're making marijuana legal, medical marijuana legal. But that doesn't make it right. What I want to do for the next few minutes is I want to look at does the Bible what does the Bible say about drugs now we can spend some some time and try to correlate correlate what the Bible says about getting drunk with drug abuse and that would be perfectly fine but but with the little time I have so there is you know you can take scriptures for example in Galatians where Paul says you should not be drunk with uh, you should not get drunk you should be uh, on fire with the spirit oh boy I don't have it it's, it's like, whatever it is I can't it's not in my notes. What am I doing? Um, <laughs> quote it for me. I'm having a brain freeze. <sighs> Somebody, help me. Not, you should not be drunk with wine, but be high on the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It would okay. be more fun to watch you. Yeah. Okay. Squirm. <laughs> anyway, the point I'm trying to make, you can... You can, you, you can take those scriptures about alcohol and applying to marijuana. But I was looking, I looked in, I wanted, is there, does the New Testament say anything specifically about drugs? And it does. The first is in Matthew 27. Jesus is, is um, brought up to Golgotha. He's about ready to be crucified. And they offer him bitter gall to drink. Bitter gall is a drug. It is a mind-altering drug. And the Romans like to give it, the Roman soldiers like to give it to uh, people they were going to crucify or execute because what, they didn't resist. You get a, a person drugged and they just, they just fall on the cross and they can, you know. It just made their work easier. They made their job easier. But in this passage, Jesus Christ refused to drink it. Why, and so you've got to ask the question, why would Jesus refuse to drink this mind, this drug that would ease his pain. And the reason is because Jesus wanted, even at that horrible moment, he refused to alter the state of his mind. And so Jesus is my example. If Jesus didn't want to alter his, the state of his mind, even at that horrible moment, I should not want to alter the state of my mind ever with the use of drugs. Galatians 5. We want to turn there, and guys, we're going to... Keep that on the screen for just a minute. The deeds of the, now this is the second instance. Now the deeds of flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, evident, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that none 
that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is a scary verse to me. This is a sobering verse. But what I want you to see here specifically, in verse 20, you see that word sorcery. See it? Sorcery is the Greek word pharmakia. It is the word which we get our word pharmacy. Pharmakia literally means the use of administration the use of administering of drugs. No, the, the means of administering drugs. It was a common practice in sorcery, and sorcery is witchcraft. If you go in the dictionary and you look up sorcery, it'll say witchcraft. <clears throat> Using drugs in the Bible, mind-altering drugs, is associated with witchcraft. And the reason is, is because when you alter your mind, you're more susceptible to demonic influences. And so witches and sorcerers would use drugs to contact evil spirits and, and, and so forth. It just opens yourself up to all that. And when we are influenced by drugs, we do things that we normally, of course, would not do. And again, notice it says if you, if you use mind-altering drugs on a regular basis as part of your pattern of life, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I didn't say that. The Word of God says it. 2 Timothy 4.2 says this. Preach the word. Be prepared in season, out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Timothy, I mean, Paul is telling Timothy, you got to be prepared to witness for Jesus. You might be in the grocery store. You might be uh, at the beach or, or whatever. But God's going to open doors for you to tell people about Jesus. And you have to be ready. My point here is, if you're smoking marijuana, your judgment's going to be impaired, and you're not going to be able to do that. Second Peter 2.19. For by what, by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For a man, for, and then this same verse in the Living Bible. For a man is a slave to whatever controls him. Drugs can be addictive. They can cause a person to become dependent. Remember, one in six adolescents who use it on a regular basis are going to become dependent, on, dependent upon them. This is the new stuff from 2010 White House website. Addiction is something that has mastery over you, so you should stay away from it. As Christians, we are to be slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing else. Now, there are times when doctors give us mind-altering drugs morphine and that type of thing after we've had surgery so you don't uh, so you get some relief from the pain but the doctor gives you that stuff uh, for a short period of time for a reason and then it's over prescription drugs have become a huge problem in the United States Mark and I have uh, counseled many people over the years who get addicted to this and it is hard to get off of it People become enslaved. <clears throat> a short testimony. For those sitting in here right now who have believed the lie that marijuana is harmless, just get a little high, feel good, a little good, you know? But you don't have to worry, it's not addicting, it's not, you're not going to get dependent. I smoke marijuana for five years every single day. Every day. I would do whatever I have to do, you know, I would do my schoolwork at, at school or, or whatever, and I was there. I was in another land <laughs> for five years. Now, every, and I, I got to the point where I had to have it every single day. Now, after five years, it, af it affected my mind. I got paranoid. I couldn't leave the house. I was seeing things. I mean, it was, I was afraid all the time. It had done something to my mind. I had to see a psychiatrist. I was seeing a psychiatrist. And the crazy thing about it is that psychiatrist's only answer to help me was to give me more drugs. <laughs> Called my dad up. My dad says, look, you're never going to get well. I've got to get off these drugs. I came back here to San Diego, and we weaned me off of these drugs. We weaned me off of these drugs to help me get over this other drug. It took a long time for me to get my... I had lost my mind, people. Direct result of marijuana. I lost, I'm, I'm taking more time, but, I'm, but we have time, this service. I lost my mind as a result. I, I became mentally ill. So no, don't, don't come to me and say, oh, it's harmless. 
No, it's not. So all of us, so every Christian should stay away from drugs because drugs are addictive and they en enslave us and we should be slaves only to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Dave, I don't know why you kept repeating and trying to convince us over and over again that you lost your mind. I mean, we don't <laughs> need any convincing. So all right, all right. It's okay. <laughs> Well, I'm going to answer another difficult question. It's one that's always asked a lot, every time by a lot of people, and that is the whole question of evil. Philosophical question goes something like this. If God is all-powerful and all-good, then why is there evil in the world? It also has kind of a personal dimension when evil or suffering touches your life. And then the question is, if God loves me, why is he allowing me to suffer like this? Let's take the philosophical question first. Some people say that they cannot believe in a God that's all-powerful and all-good because of the presence of evil. But you know, the presence of evil <clears throat> raises another question, and that is, in a world that's filled with suffering and violence and evil, how was it that the idea that its creator was entirely good and entirely kind, how did that idea come to be held by billions of people? Well, it's not because our natural reason looked at the world with this cruelty and everything and decided its creator must be kind. No, it's because God himself has revealed himself to us and the nature of the world, and he's told us why there's evil. The Bible's clear. God created the world good. He created beings in his own image, and then he transferred the stewardship of the world into our hands. Well, as you know, Adam and Eve sinned. They fell from grace. Their heart was darkened. And as a result, because we are stewards over creation, the creation fell with us as a reflection of the fall and as a sign of the fall that had gone to us. So the Bible is clear that we not God, are responsible for the presence of evil on the earth. Well, people ask the question, well, why did God create evil in the first place? And today I'm going to give you the answer to that question, if you've ever wondered it, and the answer is he didn't. See, as far back as the 5th century, the great theologian Augustine made the point that evil is not a thing that needs to be created. Evil is the absence of something. Just like darkness is not a thing, it is the absence of light. Evil is the absence of God and of his grace. And so the moment that Lucifer, the, the, also known as Satan, turned as an angel, turned from God and began to go his own way, evil was created. And the moment that Adam and Eve did the same thing, the moment they turned from trusting their creator and wanting to go their own way and eat from the knowledge of tree and uh, to be like God, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, at that point, evil became active on earth. Now, the other question people ask is, <clears throat> well, if God knew Adam and Eve were going to sin, why did he bother to create them? Now, that rests on a misunderstanding. To say that God foreknew does not mean that God could know how a free moral agent would act if that agent had never been created. Does that make sense to you at all? In other words, let's put it this way. Even God can't do things that are impossible by definition. Could God make a square circle? No, that's nonsense. Because a circle is one thing, and a square is one thing. And so to say that God can't do something that's impossible by definition is not to limit God in any way. So in the same way that he can't make a square circle, God cannot know how a person with free moral will would choose if that person were never created. If Adam truly and Eve truly had free will, that meant they had to have the capacity to choose A or B, to choose the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And it means that no one could know how they would choose until they had the ability to choose. That's the definition of truly having free will. What God can do is God can see that act from eternity. God is not bound in time. All moments in time are available to him. He sees the future just like he sees today. And so God foreknew what Adam was going to do because he foresaw it. So that's the answer to the philosophical question about evil. But what about when it becomes more personal? When you're going through something and you ask the question, why is God letting me suffer? Can I say to you that that is not a helpful question? The question why is not a helpful question. The better question to answer or ask is what can be done about my situation? Given the fact that I am living in a world that has evil, where bad things happen, where there's suffering and disease, what can I do in my present situation? 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4 we read this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, in every situation, God comforts us, so that we will learn how to comfort others who are in any affliction with the same kind of comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God is the Father of all mercy. He always comforts us. And so we find out that God offers us comfort and grace and strength and help in any circumstance. The problem, the trap is that when people begin to question God and doubt God and accuse God, how many of you know they are no longer in a posture where they can receive the grace and the help and the strength that God would give them? If you are suffering, the important question to ask is not why. The important question to ask is, am I trusting God for the grace and the help and the comfort that he promises to give me? Am I trusting him and am I receiving it? And in all suffering, we're always comforted by the knowledge that God is able to redeem every situation and bring good out of it. As Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good. He can make everything work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So God can cause good to come into your life, not only out of a welcome situation, but even out of one that causes suffering and, and, and unhappiness and difficulty. God is big enough even to bring good into your life from that. The Bible tells us that suffering is beneficial for us. In fact, suffering is even necessary for us. Because I think you know human nature, and human nature is that if things are going really well, we kind of forget about God. People tend to just focus on that, and they forget about God, who is the author of everything good, and pain gets our attention. A lot of people only find God when they encounter a problem in life, and then they're forced and they're suffering to look up. C.S. Lewis put it this way, God whispers to us in our pleasures speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And so suffering can bring, and hardship can bring maturity and growth. I mean, Hebrews 2.10 tells us this. It says that Jesus was perfected and matured through suffering. You can read that later. And then let's look at Hebrews 5.8. It says, although he, Jesus, was a son, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Do you know that obedience is really only tested and proven when you have to obey in the face of difficulty, hardship, or suffering? If even the sinless Son of God was matured and perfected through suffering and hardship, how much more can we benefit from it? All suffering that we face is an opportunity for us to demonstrate our love for God and our faith in Jesus Christ by how we respond. So if you are going through something terrible, let me encourage you by telling you that it will not last forever, that God has good plans for your life, and that no matter what suffering you might see in this life, at the end of it, you have a reservation 
for an eternity in heaven, in paradise. So as long as you're in it, as long as you're suffering, let it benefit you. And you let it benefit you by not asking, why is this happening to me? But instead asking, how can I glorify Christ in this circumstance? And how can I receive the grace that he's offered to me? In your darkest moments, don't make the stupidest mistake some people do, which is to cut themselves off from the greatest help and support they have, their loving Heavenly Father. All right. We're running out of time here, so I'm going to, but I can do this quickly. The next question, why are you laughing? I can do this quickly. What happens when a person dies? In Matthew 25, Jesus Christ gives us two groups of people. He, he talks about two groups of people with two distinct, radical, different destinies. The righteous to eternal life and those who have never accessed the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, eternal separation from God. When, you're do when you and I die, our souls separate from our bodies, whether you're a Christian or not. You, every human being has an eternal soul. Now, where that soul goes depends upon one's relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've rejected him, there's one um, uh, destination. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ, there is another. If you're saved and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the instant of your death, your soul is with God in heaven. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Can have that up there. That's the New American Standard. I quoted the King James. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 got a glimpse of heaven and it kept him living in like an expectancy of eternity for the rest of his life. When you and I die, our souls depart. Your last breath on earth is your first moment in heaven. The minute you die, you're going to be in heaven. And you're going to be looking at things that you cannot imagine. You're going to be saying hi to people that you haven't seen for a while. It's going to be amazing. Amazing. There's a book uh, out written several years ago called 90 Minutes in Heaven. If I can have that on the screen by a guy named Don Piper. That book is worth getting just to read about his d description of being in heaven for 90 minutes on earth. I mean, you know, it's, he, he went into eternity. It's pretty amazing. All right. So, but now, what about the unbeliever? What about that, that person who has never accessed the forgiveness of through Jesus Christ, the gift of eternal life. When that person dies, their soul goes to what the Old Testament calls the place of the dead. The Old Testament referred to it as Abaddon and Sheol, the place of the dead. It is, it is talked about over 100 times in the Old Testament. 250 years before Jesus uh, was born, Jews in Alexandria, because they wanted more people to have access to the Old Testament, translated the Old Testament into Greek. Greek was the uh, lingua franca of that time. Most everybody in, in the known world uh, read and spoke Greek. So they translated the Old Testament into Greek so more people could read it. When they translated the word Sheol and Abaddon, which is a place of the dead, into Greek, they used the word Hades. Okay? And that's the same word Jesus used. Hades is not hell. Hades is the place of the dead. Hades is mentioned ten times in the New Testament, and this is what we know about it. You descend into it, it's a place you can't get out of, and it's where souls of unbelievers go when they die. Mark mentioned last Sunday that, uh, if I can have the next slide up there, please. Mark mentioned last Sunday that the Bible seems to indicate that ap after Jesus' crucifixion, he went into Sheol, Hades, for a time and preached the good news and took some captives free. And those are the uh, three scriptures where we get that from, and uh, you can copy that down. But that obviously was one unique time. Hades is a place that the soul of the unbeliever goes waiting for Judgment Day. It's kind of like a holding area. It's where the Catholics get the idea of purgatory. That's where they get the whole day idea of purgatory and trying to get your soul out of there. People ask the question, are people conscious in Hades? If you look at Luke 16, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, it seems that they are. 
At the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, Moses and Elijah were there many years after their death and they were talking with Jesus. They were obviously conscious. In Revelation 20, it talks about Hades giving up the place of the dead, giving up the dead, and it, it, almost, it almost, as you read there, it's almost like they're being resurrected. Uh, so to answer the question, are people conscious in Hades, yes or no? Personally, I cannot give you, I, from the Word of God, I am not convinced either way. I don't know. Um, if you want to take the story that Jesus told in Luke 16 literally, then yes, they are. <clears throat> but I'm going to wrap up with this. The Bible says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You and I are going to stand there. The unbeliever is going to stand there. And because of Jesus, you and I, not anything on our own, we are all sinners. We're going to be declared righteous because what, what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we're going to head into eternal life that we've already started living, but we're going to live with Jesus in the new heaven and the new earth, which I don't have time to get into that. But those who do not have not access to forgiveness of sins are going to be separated from God eternally in what the Bible calls the second death. You can read about that in, Roman, in Revelation chapter 20. So, that, so here's just a short summary of this because we ran out of time, and I'm sure it's because of me. But anyway, <laughs> two, distinct, two distinct groups of people. And if I can have the worship band up here, please. Two distinct groups of people. Two radically different destinies for their souls. And as, I, and as I said, as I said earlier, Jesus rose from the dead. And I know there's a heaven, there's a hell because of it. I know there's a judgment day. I know there's a day that I'm going to be standing for Jesus and I'm going to be so happy I gave my life to him. Amen.